Hello there, English 321 students. This is your professor, um, Michael Martin, and I am doing a video recording this week simply because I'm asking you to do the same for me, and I wanted to do what I was asking you to do. And this recording will be for the two readings, the slave narratives that you're doing for this week, and I will try to do the best I can, so bear with me. It's late at night and I'm a little underdressed. Um, it's summer, so we'll use that excuse. So. Um, I'll try to be brief and want to talk to you about Harriet Jacobs' In Since the Life of the Slave Girl and Frederick Douglass's, um, it's called Life of an American Slave. I call it Narrative, The Life of Frederick Douglass. It's a book he published in three different versions. It's his autobiography and kind of a Bildum's Roman. If it were a classroom, I would have something behind me. Um, that A Bildum's Roman, by the way, is a coming of age tale, usually a male narrator male protagonists like in the Harry Potter or James Joyce's, in, uh, a James Joyce novel as well. Um, but what I want to do uh, is talk to you about the two slave narratives you did. And first off, the genre. Um, the genre itself is something unique, and it's unique to American culture and unique to American history. That, that it, it, the captivity narrative, there were such things as British captivity narratives, there were other captivity narratives who had some of the same traits, though not maybe the, the extensive religious component that ours did. But the slave narrative is a fairly unique American phenomenon. And when you read a slave narrative, it's strange. These these slaves, right, would, would supposedly be uneducated and unlearned, um, which wasn't the case at all with Frederick Douglass, who was a self-taught individual. Uh, he would give uh, street boys, Irish white boys, in... Baltimore scraps of food if they would teach him uh, to read, and uh, he, he's very uh, he, he's he's very ingenious. He reminds me of a Ben Franklin figure. Um, Harriet Jacobs a little less so. She had a a white woman kind of frame her piece, um, Lydia Maria Child, and so questions of authorship inevitably come up with these slave narratives. Did the did the person who write it come from African American descent or not? Which of course connects with racist beliefs of the time. But the genre itself, and then I'll mention just a couple things. I'll try to make it brief. The genre itself is marked by the following traits. At the beginning, and you'll notice this with Frederick Douglass, the slave doesn't know that she or he is a slave. So they enter into slavery. They, they say, I did not know I was a slave until and then insert incident. It could be when they're six, it could be when they're five. Something that shows them, well, you're quite different from your, your white friends and the white overseer that you're with. So it, it's a, often a violent intrusion into the condition or identity of being a slave. Um, there's also issues of witnessing. It's, it's why I ask you kind of about Aunt Hester. That's the woman who's whipped at the end of chapter one. The slave is somewhat of a secondary witness. She or he can't act, but they have to watch. And they're kind of this, like a, witnessing a crime, but they're not someone who can um, provide judicial power to it because they're they're, they, they don't count under the rule of law. And you'll get this in the narratives where, they're, where they will say, um, we as slaves can't speak in court. We can't you know, give our, 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 you know, our word is not veracity. A couple more things with the slave narrative. Uh, they often have a moment where they interrupt the narrative to, to directly address a white reader and mention the hypocrisy of supporting slavery. At the same time, they often use Christian epithets for a, a Christian reading audience uh, of, of their beliefs and why it doesn't comport with enslaving one fellow man or woman. So there's, it's, it's very autobiogra autobiographical, excuse me, very similar to the seamstress, right? With um, Harriet Beecher Stowe interrupting the narrative or punctuating it with her proselytizing about working class women. So do the same about the hypocrisy of slavery. These narratives were written for abolitionism. They have a particular goal and rhetorical in mind. And they often use interesting literary techniques. Um, one would be, and this will be my last point in the slave narrative as a genre, the use of apostrophe. And apostrophe means a directly addressing an inanimate object. Um, o oh, pen, thou art more free than I am. Um, I'm using it in jest, but Douglas, Frederick Douglass would do this with the fish, fish of the sea and with boats. Inanimate objects, they, they would uh, address them and it's a very stylized form, and a white reading audience, which was their reading audience, would have been familiar with it. When you read Douglas, watch for his use of rhetorical um, 
uh, shifts back and forth. Um, in one of them, he uses, and I'm shifting gears here, bear with me for one second. He uses reverse language and um, he says, you know, he would whip her to make her scream and whip her to make her hush, right? So you see the, the repetition of the verbs whip, and this is paragraph five from uh, his first chapter, whip upon her naked back till she, till she was literally covered with blood. And he's talking about um, his, his, the overseer of his master. Um, this is Mr. Plummer, who was a miserable drunkard, a profane swearer, and a savage monster. He'll mention um, that they don't live up to, to good traits. Drunkard, a white audience would not like it, a drunkard. So they'll mention how um, profligate and lack, lacking morals these slave traders are. But the, the idea would be, this passage I just read, he often reverses his syntax or uses parallel syntax for effect. And that's something that he, he uses throughout uh, in, uh, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. But the most important thing that I wanted to mention for you today, and one more thing about that, um, Jacobs was writing to a white Northern women audience. So she directly addresses white Northern women throughout her work, the idea would be to get them on the side of, of abolitionism, and it's written for women. Douglas is writing for a larger audience, but when you answer the question about women and uh, for your post this week, you may want to mention, talk about um, issues of audience, right? Both, both real and implied. But the most important thing um, about the reading for Harriet Jacobs, I think, is something that I could clarify for you a little bit. Uh, Harriet Jacobs refers to herself as Linda Brent. It's a pseudonym. She, she's on the Underground Railroad. She's a, thankfully, she escapes. And she's writing this narrative a, a couple years afterwards for the cause of, of, of anti-slavery. Um, but in the passage you read, the three chapters, right? I wrote these down. Another link to life, um, continued persecutions, and scenes at plantation, 14, 15, and 16. What's happened is that, as you probably under, know, she's under Dr. Flint's ownership as his, uh, as his property, whatever that might mean. And she is actually having a child with a white lawyer named Mr. Sands. She's a teenager at this point. It's kind of, it, it's creepy to us. But what's happened is she has to kind of explain to white female readers that she is a virtuous woman, even though she had sex outside of marriage. And you, you and I think that's ridiculous. Um, but if you look at the beginning of, ch of the chapter, I think it's, it's chapter 15, she mentions the word pure. She would have been held to a higher standard of, of, um, of morality, unfortunately, even as a, as a, as a, a slave, because um, something called the cult of true womanhood in the 19th century would have meant good, good domestic, good mother, and a virgin before marriage. And for her, as you know, she is sexual property. Um, but what the chapters you're reading are her fighting off Norcom figuratively and literally, as you see when he attacks Benny. Um, and her grandmother is there as well. But she's just had two children. That's why the chapter 14 is called Another Link to Life. And she is in, in this weird in-between world where she's had kids. She's had this relationship with Mr. Sands. He doesn't really free the children. He kind of says he will. He treats her well, but that's relative. Nor comes enraged, though he doesn't ever, thankfully, sexually assault her. At least that's what she says. And he wants her permission. And that's why he keeps talking to her. He says, I'm, I keep, I'm my kindness towards you. He wants her permission for her to be his mistress, if that makes sense. His, his, his wife, Dr. Flint, is... In real life, Dr. Norcom, a nouveau riche um, plantation owner in North Carolina, uh, in the Piedmont area. And he, his wife is privy to it. And that's why you get so many references to family, because it, it upsets the white family. It upsets the black family structure, um, as, as, as long as you have a slave there. It, it upsets both. So in this period, she's, as, she's starting her escape. And Jacobs actually is, escapes by staying for a long period of time at her grandmother's attic. At, um, and what they do is they create a, like a, a seven by nine little space in the attic and she lives there. And her children don't know it, only her grandmother does. Um, she doesn't leave. And she eventually leaves via, I think it's via ship up north uh, much, much later and fools Norcom, Dr. Flint, excuse me, 
uh, that's a pseudonym, into thinking that she's she's gone. And you're starting to see at the very end when she mentions the graveyard scene, when she mentions these walks at night, it, the plans coming into motion. And she's she's kind of torn between leaving her kids, which she'll have to do temporarily, and and desiring for freedom. And she she goes for the latter, thankfully. Um, it, it, the, the, the slave narrative as a genre usually ends with the slave having to decide whether she or he wants to buy their freedom. Uh, Douglas gets free, right? Um, Douglas, Douglas has British benefactors who help him. Um, Jacobs has Northern benefactors who help her despite the fugitive slave law of 1850, which have, would have meant anyone helping a slave in the North would have been punished. A white person would have been punished. But at the end, they have to decide, do I, do I buy my freedom and legitimize the institution of slavery, or do I not? And it's it's a real final dramatic moment for each of these narrators when you get to the very end. Douglas is a slightly better writer. He, he, he's got rhetorical flair and flourish. Um, vivid scenes of violence. I asked that in the post for this week. Why? Or, or you know, I asked that for the, the assignment this week, a recording that you're going to do, like I'm doing, um, why he has these, you know, lurid moments of violence. And, and then with Anne Hester, um, Actually, that might be for the post, but issues of genealogy and family are certainly part of it. Um, the only other things I would say about these pieces, um, Douglas is in Maryland. Um, Jacobs, at first, is a domestic servant in um, North Carolina. And for her, and for him, for him especially, the logic would be, well, some slave owners are kind. He'll he'll show his overseer as a drunkard who enjoys uh uh, violence upon a slave. So he's, he's playing with whatever stereotype there is. He's playing with it and he's going to turn it on the head. Um, the other stereotype is that it, it's perfectly fine to be a slave in Maryland. Maryland's not the deep south. You're not a chained slave on a plantation in Alabama or Louisiana. And um, he's playing against that stereotype, saying, no, I, I'm here I am near the eastern shore and I'm treated as if I'm chattel and I'm treated terribly. So playing against those stereotypes. Same thing with Harry Jacobs, who at first is, is more of a domestic servant rather than someone who's working in the fields, um, they have to show the horrors because that argument had um, prevalence at the time that there were gradations of slavery, such as a good slave master or living in Maryland uh, as a slave that are better than others. So they're both playing with that as well. Um, the end of the Jacobs chapter 16 might get a little confusing. She's in the graveyard. She's kind of adding a little bit of dramatic flair. She sees her kids at night, um, Benny and Ellen, all those particular things. But it, 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 again, the transition is to into her freedom and into her um, living um, uh, for a few years in her grandmother's attic. So uh, these pieces, it continues with um, just, just one or two more things. For Douglas, if you, if you read on, um, he has a pivotal moment later in his life where uh, an overseer is meant to break him. And this is the, the language that um, Jacobs uses. She says her kids are being sent to the plantation to be broke. I'm not using the correct verb tense, but I'm using her language there. Um, and that's part of the reason she wants to escape. She knows that, that it's coming sooner or later, and she she doesn't want her children kind of tethered there. But Douglas fights one of his overseers. His name is Mr. Covey. He's a slave owner, uh, a, a slave breaker, if that makes sense. And he physically fights him back. And they have a, a battle royale, and neither wins. But Covey never fights him again. And, and it's a powerful moment. It's one extremely powerful moment where Douglas realizes I, I have mental strength, I have physical strength, I can, I can survive, I can make it. Um, Jacobs finds independence through, through her sexual relations with Mr. Sands, but most importantly, through moving up north and eventually being reunited um, uh, with Benny and Ellen, the pseudonyms for her children, uh, up there. So that's a pivotal moment for him. For her, it's Mr. Sands and that you read it, you read a little bit about the white lawyer um, and her escape up north. So I think I'll end it there. Um, it was nice speaking with you. Good luck with the projects this week. I tried to give you something besides an essay. I thought you'd appreciate that. And good night and good